Good morning to all participants and to our speakers. Hello, Tom. Hello, Vincent. Hi. Hello. Hello, Olivier. Hello, everyone. So welcome to the fourth of the five chapters of the Smart Manufacturing Week. This webinar is moderated by Philippe Geno and myself. And after addressing EU trends in digitalization and sustainability, smart manufacturing processes, smart value and supply chains, we will introduce this morning smart eco-technologies in cities of the future, construction and industry. Here is a quick overview of the program today. Free presentation on smart energy, water and construction will be given respectively by Tom Eichen, Head of Energy Transition and Senior Advisor to CEO at Ensevo, Vincent Popov, CEO of Amamundu Technologies, and Olivier Vassar, CEO of Stelligence ArcelorMittal. Before we get started, here are some guidelines on the virtual lobby. So as you can see, you have two sets of nav navigation bars uh, and on the left and right hand side of the screen. On the left hand side, in the lobby, you can access the presentation videos of the service providers by clicking on their logo. And the second tab will allow you to access the replays of the previous webinars, including the introduction of, by the Minister of the Economy, Mr. Franz Fayot. On the right side, you can see at the top is the Q&A section where you can send your questions. Do not hesitate to raise questions during the various presentations. My colleague uh, Philippe will collect them for the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Just below, uh, the next button is the polling section. That uh, will be, uh, you can uh, click on this uh, button right now. There is a question waiting for you. You can answer it. And this polling session will be used, for example, uh, during Olivier Vassar's presentation. Moving on now to our speakers. It is a pleasure to have you today, Tom. So Tom will talk about energizing smart buildings, districts, and cities. Tom, the floor is yours. So uh, thank you very much. I will uh, try to uh, to uh, present my slides. So uh, thank you for having me today uh, to to uh, for this framing uh, uh, framing presentation. I was asked to do, give a framing presentation concerning the uh, issue of smart buildings, districts, and and cities. And it's very important uh, that I want not only to focus on energy but uh, present more holistical thinking. In 12 to 14 minutes of time, it will not be possible to go to each detail, so please see my presentation more as uh, input uh, that I give uh, to the discussion or uh, some thinking uh, and some general frame discussion. So, in my uh, uh, last years when I was with this uh, smart uh, uh, building subject, green building subject, I, I was uh, astonished by the terminological mess that we have in this sector. So if we speak about sustainable built environment, uh, uh, we are submerged by, by terminologies like green building, green city, zero carbon city, sustainable building, nachhaltige Quartiere, eco quartier, zero carbon city, uh, low carbon buildings, climate neutral, and so on, and so on, and so on. So this terminological mess does not help to describe what is, in fact, green, what is circular, what is zero carbon, what is energy or resource efficient. And my thinking that I want to present is to, to bring, at least to try to bring a little bit of order in our discussion, so uh, uh, to be able to describe what is it about when we have a sustainable built environment and when we want to describe it. So uh, my first thinking is, um, how do we structure this subject? If we look at the world at our planet, then uh, we, we have to give us some, some definitions. Uh, uh, the most simple ones are, what is building? We create building uh, uh, everywhere uh, uh, where we construct cities or districts, and this is the, 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 the principal note of everything when we speak about the environment. Uh, later on, we create out of that 
in combination with more buildings, we create districts, and um, out of that we form normally uh, cities. And uh, when we uh, when we have to uh, to bring together all these buildings and uh, to fuel them with energy, uh, we, we combine them or we connect them through an infrastructure, uh, be it a data infrastructure, but mainly also an energy uh, infrastructure. So the, the general principle, not, not something new for everybody of you, but only to have the same words uh, in mind. So when, when we have then this uh, definition uh, with its infrastructure and how these buildings are connected, we can go a little bit further and try to say, what is this built environment that you see here? What is about uh, a description that makes it sustainable? What would be a description that makes it circular? What would be a description that makes it smart? And what would be uh, a, 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 a definition or a description to make it uh, adequately and sustainably energized? And I will uh, try to touch upon these four uh, segments uh, to give my thoughts uh, as an input to, to this session. First of all, we will have a look at uh, at the circular issue. So we speak a lot about circular buildings, districts, and city, but what it is in the general lines about. To explain this in more general terms, in my eyes, it is, it is uh, uh, very useful to say, okay, we create a city, a district, and a building, which we, we create a certain technosphere, and uh, we, um, com we, we, we create it by going to the ecosphere and taking something out of that. So we need sources to create this built environment. And uh, when we don't use this uh, built environment anymore, we destroy the buildings or we, we, um, uh, we, we don't use them anymore. We give back this material and everything that we use during lifetime of these districts to the sinks. So when we look at the resources and the sources that we have, we have all the known natural resources, uh, uh, water, sun, air, uh, biomass, but also these non-natural uh, uh, fossil resources or materials that we take out of. of uh, and on the side of the things, we, we, when we throw it away, to put it in, in simple terms, then we throw it away either to the soil, to the water, or to the air. And, and when we look how our uh, economy is today organized to create this technosphere, it's uh, the so-called linear economy. We take out these resources, we make something of it, we use it, and we dispose it again. Uh, in the sinks, and uh, only to show you what what was happening in the, the last uh, decades uh, uh, in the world when we speak about global material extraction, what we all take out of, of uh, from resource side. You see here in green the biomass we take out uh, during the last year on the world level. Then then you see here the non-metallic minerals in orange. Then later on uh, you you can see here uh, the energy part we take out. So the fossil fuels, which is a quite small part compared to the other ones, which we mainly burn, and then the metal ores that we take out of, of our sources. So what I want to say with that, the main of these elements, we, to put it in simple terms, we throw them away in things, either we burn them and give them back to the air in the atmosphere, either we use them and give them back or parts of them to the water, or we um, or we give them back to the soil in, in disposing them definitely, uh, uh, definitely there. So uh, when we speak about circular, then this should not be disposed anymore. And, uh, uh, and we, we look at the principles from the circular economy, and if we want to say a built environment is a circular environment, we have to, to work like this. We, we take still out the resources of the system, but we let them circulate in the atmosphere either through sharing, through repairing, through reusing, through remanufacturing, and through recycling. That's the principles. And the aim of all these circling in the technosphere is to dispose less material, again, in the sinks. And uh, when we want really to speak about a technosphere or a city, a district, or a building level that respects the rules of circular economy, we have to apply and measure these principles. Otherwise, we will uh, not uh, be able to describe it correctly. I come now to the second uh, part uh, when it comes to the description of the built environment. This is about smart. If we speak about smart building district and city, I heard millions of definitions. I tried to give some thinkings about that uh, too. So when, when we want to describe what is smart, I would bring it to 
to, uh, um, to the different dimensions we have. When we look at the, the building level, what is a smart building? Um, in my eyes, we have to consider four, uh, four, four elements. First, the smart living. There are people who live there in the houses. They use smart services. Uh, they are smart people because they are able to use smart services. And they do with these services, when it comes to resource use, something more intelligent than if they would not be smart. So this is all about smart buildings. It means we have a digitization that brings a building to be more intelligent and the interaction with the people leads to less resource intensive consumption. If we look this on the uh, district level, we, we have the smart mobility and smart infrastructure um, added to these components. That means when we have more buildings that interact and where people interact and and, and are going between, in between these buildings, they, they are mobile, they, they are going from A to B, and they have smart infrastructure to use it. So uh, on the district level, it is smart. This is about organizing these two components in addition to the building level. And when it comes to uh, the um, uh, smartness of the city level, then it, it's clear that we need a smart government and an organization for a smart economy that supports that buildings and districts can generate smartness uh, with their inhabitants. So when we want to describe what is a smart building, a smart district, and a smart city, we have, in my eyes, to have measuring instruments uh, that certify us that we are indeed respecting these uh, uh, dimensions of the uh, smartness. Uh, I would like to come to the next uh, um, aspect which is sustainability. This is very much and very intensively uh, discussed last year, what, when, in which situation uh, a, a city, a district or a building can be sustainable. So let's come again back to our ecosphere and uh, if we speak about sustainability, I try really to put it in 30 seconds, it's not easy to show it like that, but we take resources, mm, fossil, material, yes, but also biomass, we give it to the system and again we dispose but, but i would tend to say we take it out more sustainability more sustainably and we dispose it more sustainably. it's not about circling it's about disposing and taking more respectful to the natural environment uh, where we are and uh, uh, this description these systems uh, have been uh, um, worked uh, or, or or certifications try to describe this and uh, use it as a criteria to describe more sustainable buildings, districts, and cities. So this is about sustainability. We come to the last one, which, which is uh, the key of my title of the, the presentation. It's about energy. When we look uh, to such a, a, a technosphere, which is a city, a district, and a building, so th the first issue that, uh, that we should look at is how do, you f do we fuel this technosphere today? So it's more about a general issue, what I say, but it's important in this structure to understand it like this. First of all, we take out fossil resources, we bring them, we burn them, and we dispose them, mainly in the atmosphere. That's the energy system we, we have today. So we take out something we can burn, we burn it and give it back to the atmosphere. This, this, uh, this creates the, the known carbon problem that we have in the atmosphere. And if we want to have really uh, um, an energy system that, that is not disposing in the atmosphere anymore, we, sh we have to change this energy system fundamentally from the building level, from the district level, from the city level, but also from the infrastructure level. I will come to that. So from this fossil-based system, when we want to go to a renewable and energy efficient system, we should take out more of these resources, take them as a fuel, and here I indicate geothermal energy, which is in the soil, take them, bring them to the atmosphere, so again a take, but a take of natural resources, and bring them to make the supply side renewable. One thing we have to do if we want, we really have to have, have renewable and energy efficient uh, cities and districts. But we, we should not say we take it out and that's enough because it's renewable. We should also we take uh, as less as possible out from the natural resources because before 
we make the system and the city efficient. So we have to make the demand side efficient to take out of the system less, as I show you here in the graphic, less of natural resources. It should not be the conclusion that the fact that it is a natural resource, we can take it out endlessly. It should be the conclusion, first, we reduce the demand. Second, we take out the rest from the natural resources. So we have two main pillars to become more demand side efficient and more supply side renewable. And we have to describe this with clear criteria to quote really, is this a sustainable city or is this a renewable or energy efficient city or not? I come now to the, the infrastructure question. What will happen with the electricity grid? We know the electricity grid today, it combines every building in, in a district. I have here as an example uh, only shown two. And uh, what is the system today? We take out of the, uh, the resource, we burn it in, in huge uh, power plants and bring it on a centralized way to the customers. That's the system that we have today. So it is a centralized carbon-based electricity grid. What, what will happen in the future and what is already about to happen and what has to happen if we want really to speak about sustainable cities and uh, that means that we have to come to a distributed, fully digitized and renewable electricity grid. What does that mean? This does mean that we have still centralized energy that comes from wind and mainly from sun and we will have also decentralized production on buildings. And these distribute, will be distributed between consumers, that's a new effect. Uh, which we see rise in the energy transition today. So what will happen when people are able to produce at home? They will become prosumers, you know all this technology, but they will be able to become different things. They can be renewable self-consumers, they can jointly act as renewable self-consumers, so they consume, they produce, they share, they can organize through the grid and digitized grid peer-to-peer -peer trading with the electrons they can have a renewable energy community as an organization form to share their energy, and they have the ability to create citizen energy communities. This is not terminologies invented by Tom Eich and myself. This is terminologies that we have in the recent European directives, all these terminologies that have to be implemented uh, at the national level in the upcoming years. When we look now at the gas grid, what is the future of the gas grid? Let's look what it is today. It's a centralized carbon-based gas grid. We take out gas, uh, so methane, from, from, from the system, out of sources, out of carbon sources. We bring it centralized form to the, uh, to the end customers. The, the question is what, what will happen if we decarbonize until 2050 the gas grids? This means we have to get them green, otherwise they will not be decarbonizable. So we have to put green gas in it. And this green gas will come mainly from two sources. Now, millions of choices. The first source will be biogas and biomass, and the second one will be hydrogen. So, uh, uh, and the third effect that we will have, we will not have centralized production anymore, but we will have also decentralized biogas and biomass production, which will be injected uh, in the grid. So, we will be confronted by biomass injecting and more biomass uh, gases. Let's look now at the last uh, infrastructure we have. We have today in some of the cities high temperature, carbon-based central heating grids. Uh, this is what I show here. And these grids function like all the systems, centralized, as I said before, and mainly based on, on uh, fossil energy. What is the future uh, in, uh, in this changing world for the heating grids? In my eyes, they will be more decentralized. We will have on the district level heating grids that are low temperature, so means lower temperatures than today, they will be based on renewable and they will be decentral. So what you see here is the example of having three districts with heating grids. These heating grids will be fueled by decentralized uh, uh, production units uh, and mainly based on biomass and, and, uh, and geothermal energy and uh, there will be an additional effect in the future which we'll see on the building, we will have heat production. And this heat production will be either fueled by sun, by biomass, or also by geothermal energy. We will have the potential, even if I see it later, uh, that this will be distributed between the consumers in a certain manner, sharing in a small district. It will be possible, but I think it will not happen today, it will not happen tomorrow, but perhaps after tomorrow. So again, this repeats, the structure can repeat on different district levels, and um, we will see a potential of presumer uh, to have more uh, of these systems. Um, 
To conclude, when we look at these three infrastructures, so once again, electricity, gas, and the distributed heating grids, what will happen in the future with these grids when have they an interaction which they have not today? And yes, they will have, there will be a potential. When there is too much wind and sun, we will have to put it somewhere. And therefore, the power to gas technology will come and we will convert electricity that is too much in the grid into perhaps gas and bring it to the gas infrastructure. And there will be an effect where we have power to heat. So that means if we have too much wind and sun in the system, we shall put it somewhere. And to put it somewhere, we can put it in heat and bring it to the heating grid. So there will be an interaction between these different uh, technologies and that uh, uh, we mean by that the uh, sector coupling uh, and this will develop in the upcoming uh, years. So what I said before, if we want to say I live in a sustainable building or a green building or a zero carbon building, I live in such a district or a city, we, we have to have measuring instruments to describe it. We have to say, okay, how can I describe that a city is circular? How can I describe that uh, 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 a building is uh, sustainably energized, how can I say that a district is smart? So, and we have today these, um, these and here are only examples, these instruments like certification mechanisms, like building circularity passports, like green building certification as DGNB, Green, HQE, uh, and also energy certifications, we have eco criteria labeling, uh, and we have also certification schemes uh, from for smartness. So we have these measuring instruments, which I show here as an example, and we have to develop them and bring them together. Either we will not be able to describe the sustainably built environment in a holistically and uh, adequate manner. So uh, uh, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, only two words about uh, what we and what we have to do at Encebo uh, to do in all this. So. Um, we're um, in, in many of these domains an active player with our subsidiaries and uh, we want to shape uh, uh, the future uh, energy landscape uh, in our greater region and to help support these thinkings uh, uh, in the future. So I thank you for the attention. I hope I wasn't too long and too fast. I want you to stay and to bring to you this message. Thank you for your attention. Happy to discuss it. Thank you, Thank you, Tom, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I remind the viewers that you can ask your questions on the uh, right-hand side of the screen. Uh, please do so, uh, so that we can uh, use these questions for the Q&A session at the end of the presentations. Um, now, uh, Vincent, Vincent Popov will take us uh, to a journey towards factories and building autonomous in water. Over to you, uh, Vincent. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I will share my presentation. Okay. Wait, sorry for that. Okay, so I'm ready. So, uh, yes, so thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, it's always a, a pleasure for, for us to speak about the topic we feel very concerned about, uh, which is uh, uh, water. So uh, let me start with some uh, facts and figures, and to be more precise, to start with the figures. So 2035 is basically the date we estimate that the Luxembourg will experience serious uh, shortage of uh, water. And there is even some studies showing that perhaps it's a bit uh, optimistic. Demographic expansion, industrial development, and climate change put uh, more and more uh, pressure on these uh, precious uh, resources, which is uh, water. At some point, all the country will be concerned. So you might think that it's uh, it's far, but in fact, it's not. It's already right now. Uh, I will show you a fact. So basically, just a, a fact I picked um, in which is, uh, you might all know, uh, because there was a lot of articles in the newspaper about it. It's about uh, the, the Greek producer of yogurt, uh, Fage, which wanted to, to, to set up a factory here in Luxembourg. They, uh, they bought uh, a field, and uh, they have to fight for four to five years, and after they have simply to give up. Why? Because they were just told, okay, Sorry, guys, your process uh, consumes too much water, and there is not enough water uh, in Luxembourg. So it's already here right now. 
Is it, however, a fatality? Not necessarily. In fact, the main problem with water comes uh, to, the, to the way we are using it. Uh, for the moment, we are taking water from the environment, using it and discard it uh, in a very linear way, like uh, Tom uh, said uh, just before. Why not uh, simply recycle it? Okay, so if you have uh, a smart reuse at the level of a building, of a factory, you would allow to have always uh, water available uh, locally. Okay, and at the same time, you will decrease the, the pressure on the, on the environment. So it makes even more sense if you consider what is water. So what goes out of a, a building, basically, is not pure water, it's wastewater. So first of all, let, let me modify a bit this one because I don't like it in a, in a context of a circular economy to have the word waste linked to water doesn't make any sense. So just call it use water or raw water. Okay. So what is this raw water coming out of the building? Basically, it's water, of course. It's also it. Huh? If you have processed water coming out of a factory or if you have water uh, coming from a, a residential uh, building, okay, like coming from the from the kitchen or coming from the bathroom, okay, it's hot water. So it contains it, and also this it can be recycled. Of course, it makes sense only if you do this recycling locally. It makes even more sense. You know, I tell you that uh, in the classical model, 60 to 70 percent of the price of water is linked to the network. Okay, so it makes even more sense to have something uh, local. And the third things you will find in this raw water is residue. So basically what I call a residue here, it's all the compounds, the chemical compounds, which are not uh, water. Okay, And this residue can also be valued, for, like uh, they can be used as a fertilizer to grow plants. They can be used as energy. Uh, if you send them to a biogas plant, you can recover uh, some energy. So let's say it in a different, uh, in different ways, basically, it will end up to do exactly the same thing we are uh, already doing it for solids, uh, where you have the solids and you sort them with glass, packaging, paper, and so on, okay? And you value for, and you recycle this different fraction. Here you will have the water, okay? So with water plus it plus residue. And you will also sort this, uh, these elements and to recycle them. So the question now is how to do it. So. I will not do a full technical course of what are the technology possibility to do it. Okay, I will just show you the process we are using at Amamundu. So basically, it's a pure filtration process or a pure physical process. So there is no transformation, no biological reaction, no chemical reaction. Okay, we just allow the water to run through three different uh, steps of, of uh, filtration, okay, to sort the different elements they have in it. So you have first a sieve, okay, just to remove the, the, the big particles which have uh, end up in the in the water. You have then a nanofiltration. So nanofiltration just means that you are filtrating uh, through pores which are on, of nanometer size. So nanometers, uh, to give you an idea, it's around 100,000 times uh, smaller than air, okay, and then you have an even smaller. Uh, um, a filtration step, which is reverse osmosis, okay? And you end up with water, as I said, uh, if it's uh, hot, you can also recover this heat, so you can have hot water, and uh, all the, the residues are uh, concentrated, concentrated in a liquid fraction. So j just to, to worry about the nanofiltration which are using, in fact, it's what we call dynamic uh, nanofiltration. So in fact, we are uh, using uh, a disc, we have a disc of ceramic, Okay, which are the filters, they are assembled into uh, a module. During the, the filtration, the discs are allowed to spin, okay, which create a flow at the surface of the disc and which clean them. Okay, so we have like auto-cleaning uh, filters, which uh, make that you decrease energy consumption and you also uh, decrease operation cost. Okay, so at the end you have something which is modular, autonomous, energy effective, which can be controlled remotely and with a very low maintenance and no um, uh, operation cost. So if I show you this slide, it's not just for the pleasure to show you our technology. It was more to, to show you the, the, the feature, uh, uh, the feature uh, because this is the feature we target. This, we think, it's the feature which are needed for uh, technology, whatever it is, to be implemented for doing water recycling at the level of the factory 
or uh, a building. So I, I was told to, to put like more on a focus on the eco cities. So I will do so. I show you some technical aspect. Okay, so, so as you can see, uh, technology is there. Okay, I show you my technology, but with also other technology uh, is there to do uh, to do the job from an economic point of view. From, due to the fact that if you do it locally, you don't have all the price uh, for the network. It's uh, also for, um, interesting. Okay, but often in the project, the the bottleneck is more uh, the low. Okay, reglementation. Okay, because all the, the law for now are more built for a linear model, okay, and sometimes it doesn't fit for a, a circular economy. So, there the, the used to be uh, already a standard since a, a couple of years, okay, what I wrote it here, a European standard, say, okay, at a level, at a level of a building, you can take rainwater, okay, and you can use for uh, usage like toilets, laundry, watering, and cleaning, okay. Quite recently, and when I say recently, I mean uh, last year, there was a new European standard say, okay, you can do the same by uh, using grey water. So basically what is uh, grey water, it's all the, the water coming out of the building except the water from toilets. So it's water coming from bathroom, coming from laundry, coming from dishwashing, coming from kitchen. And this is a main it, 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 it's a main advantage because the problem of rainwater it's it can rain a lot for a couple of days and then nothing for uh, several weeks. So meaning that if you want to to, to use rainwater you, you need to have a big storage tank okay to to collect the the, the water when it comes. The big advantage of uh, uh, the the grey water it's you produce it when you need it. Okay, I explain this. If, for example, if you take a shower, okay, the, the, the water you have used for the shower is immediately available to be put in the toilet. Okay, and also here between the resources and the, the usage is quite balanced. So basically, you produce exactly the, the, the amount of water you, uh, you will need. Okay, and also uh, the, the third advantage, it's uh, that, uh, as I said, uh, already said, uh, water coming from the bathroom or the kitchen, it's also hot, so you can recycle this, uh, this, uh, this heat. So to give you uh, quite some some uh, concrete example of what can be done. So here it's a, it's an example where we have with uh, Waterlink. So Waterlink it's a water company uh, which is uh, distributing water at uh, Antwerp in the north of uh, Belgium. Okay. So basically there are interesting thinking which is more and more the case for the different water companies to say okay our job it's uh, to take. Uh, water from resources, okay, and to have in a good quality to distribute it. We use to take water from lake, lake, river, sea, groundwater, okay, groundwater, uh, grey water coming out of the building, basically, it's just like uh, resources like the others, okay, we just need to put the, the proper uh, process in front of it to produce uh, uh, good, um, uh, good water. And here, what you can see, on the, on, the, on, the, on the picture, it's um, uh, basically an example. It's uh, it's uh, of uh, uh, a machine. They, they put it at the level of a restaurant in an eco district. Okay, so they treat the water of the restaurant. So you can see on the two glass on the left, it's the water how it comes out of the restaurant, and then it's how uh, it is after after the filtration. And here they also push the, the project quite far as they, they, they go until having a drinkable quality for water. Uh, another example to show uh, you what is possible uh, to do. So here it's a case of, uh, of a company. So it's a company in, uh, in the south of France, which is uh, close to the sea. So which is uh, taking its water directly from the floor. So it's uh, groundwater, but they don't have uh, access to a wastewater uh, network. Okay, so what they do, they collect all the water. So here it's not only the grey water, it's also the water coming out of the, of the toilets and they filter it. So they concentrate all the residues, so they have a smaller volume, which is easier to, to handle, okay, because they don't have access to the wastewater uh, network, and they have uh, clear water. Because in this setup, they also take the water from the toilet, the, the water they end up at the end is not totally pure, it still contains some residue. And this residue, what are there? It's, it's nitrogen, phosphorus, so basically it's fertilizer. And they use this uh, uh, water 
to water the grass. Okay, so, and in fact, here what they, they, what they are doing, they are at the same time recycling the water, but also uh, recycling a part of this residue as a fertilizer. Okay, so, we are, we, well, without this, they would not have been uh, able to, uh, to water their grass, okay, because they are not allowed during summer. To, to take too much water from uh, from uh, the ground. Okay, so this it's, it's it's a good transition to to go a bit uh, a bit further. Okay, and to try to to, to imagine uh, what would be uh, eco cities in uh, in the future. So if you remember, I uh, say uh, uh, where, where water or water coming out of the building, it's water, heat, and residue. For, okay, and in the future, we can imagine that we will. We use locally the weekly of uh, all of these compounds. And you see here, yeah, I pick up a couple of, of uh, a very beautiful picture of how it could look like eco cities in the future. And you can see there is a lot of green, okay? So meaning that we will recycle the water, the heat, but also the residue as fertilizer, okay? Either to grow plants or to grow uh, microalgae, like you can see on the picture on uh, the right. So we will go more and more that a building is not only a roof, on the wall, okay, so, but it's a building will also have a function, okay, so, they will be able to treat water, they will be able to um, to uh, produce energy, so, they will be uh, able to produce food, they will be uh, able to uh, to uh, to treat uh, air, okay, so, so I, I, I will let you for, uh, on this uh, on this beautiful picture, and I will thank you for your attention. Okay, and of course, uh, it was a bit short time to, to explain all this context, but uh, feel free to, to contact me uh, if you want to, to go a bit uh, further on these uh, topics. Thank you, Vincent, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Let's hope that we can drink uh, water coming out of your innovative systems in the very near future. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I hope so. So now, Olivier Vassa will uh, uh, show us how steel is, is a key sustainable material uh, in the resilient cities of tomorrow. Olivier, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So one, one first thing I, I want you to, to think about is to look around you. So to look around your house, to look around your, your building. And what you will see is that you will find steel everywhere. Of course, you have obvious things that you will see. That's all the structures and 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 buildings which are which are made of steel. But that's not all. You find steel everywhere around you, in your kitchen, in your bathroom, in your car, uh, in your washing machine, in into your smartphone. So, steel is is present everywhere in in the world and in our in our life another point when when you look at the steel produced on the planet barely the half of it will end up in construction so steel and construction is a is a really long story and again steel is not only steel construction it is also the Concrete buildings are using and relying also on a lot of steel used. I want now to invite you to go to the pool and there are two small questions that I would like you to answer. Now the first question is devoted to the weight of the building. And the second question, we are talking today about sustainability and, and circular, circular economy and technologies. It's about the, the recycling rate of steel. So I let you some seconds and then I will go on my, on my next slide. So steel is in fact the most recycled material on the planet. Why is it so recycled because it's really easy to separate steel from the other material with the magnetic properties of steel we can easily sort it out in your garbage at home in your the blue bag you put in the in the waste of the in the waste of the construction so in the construction sector steel is recycled at nearly 100 percent so we recover at the end of the building 100 percent 
of the material. But this is not enough to speak about recycling of of material and thinking that will th this will be the answer. The world is facing a a really big challenge. We have today around two hundred thousand people which are moving into cities every day. So we need to be able to sustain this. We have a, a growing world population that must reach 9 billion inhabitants by 2050. And all of these people will need affordable housing, affordable place to work, affordable infrastructure. And all these buildings are representing barely the half of the CO2 emission that we are doing. So that's huge, that's massive. So we, we focus a lot of effort on the industry and transportation when, when, when we touch CO2. But the building in where you live, the building in where you work, are representing a really big shank of, of the CO2 emission. It means that we will need new approaches to, to sustain our way of life. We, we cannot continue to build like we build today. We, we need to change completely the, the, the philosophy. So some years ago, ArcelorMittal has decided to, to look at the, at the construction market from, from another perspective. And we launch the, we launched a project when we started to look not at steel anymore, but but really at the at the cities, and 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 we wanted to look at what will be the cities of tomorrow. And and it's clear that the city of tomorrow they will need resilience. The the building, if we walk around today, we see many buildings everywhere which are destroyed. Most of them, if not all of them, they are not destroyed because there is issue with their integrity, because they, there is issue with the, with the bearing capacity of the building. They are destroyed because they don't correspond anymore to the needs of the market, to what people want. The, the building we have done, and often the building we are continuing to do, we cannot transform them. They are not adaptable. They are not intelligent. They are not interacting with the surrounding environment. And if we don't change this and changing the way we do building, we will continue to build and within some years destroy and build again. That, that's not the right way to, to, to tackle or, or build environment. We need we need to build our building as, as living entities and building that will be able to, to adapt to the future needs. So today, when we build an office, tomorrow in the same area, we probably need residents. We, we probably need supermarket and, and the offices are not, are not anymore a, a good, a good thing. When we look at Luxembourg, the, the, the park and ride we have, when they were built, they were at the boundaries of the city. Today, most of them, they are nearly in the city center of, of Luxembourg. So the, the new one that will be built, they, they will be built at a bigger distance from the city center. But all these buildings are not adaptable. So we we have look in order to understand we we have look at how building is is arranged today so we have on the slide we are an, an investor we we want we want to build something so first thing and first thing we realize is that at the design stage everything is organized in in silos it means that we have different parts in the building and each of the stakeholders are optimizing their part. So we have the foundation, 
we have the engineers that will optimize the structure of the building. They will optimize the floors of the building. Then there is another team with a specialist in thermal calculation and so on and, and, and lighting, uh, natural lighting that will optimize the envelope of the building. And finally, we will, we will optimize all the HVAC systems and ventilation systems of the building. But at the end of the day, the building is, is an assembly of all this. So we created the BIM. A lot of people are speaking about BIM to, to resolve a lot of issue. It's clear that the BIM will resolve in advance the buildability of the building. It means when we will put together all these components, we will see with the BIM if they are compatible one with the other. But we will never assess if this assembly of optimum is an optimum. In any mathematical system, in any scientific system, the sum of optimum is equal to the global optimum. It means that we need to look at the building holistically. We need to look at the building as a full entity and sometimes invest more in some area in order to optimize the complete building. Then what does it mean optimizing? You can discuss with 100 people, they will have 100 different opinion. You can optimize the cost to have the cheapest building as possible. If you ask an engineer, he will optimize the weight of the element. If you ask, I would say, the, the, the stakeholders, the final users, the, they want an environmental optimization. If you discuss with building users, the optimum for them is a full flexibility of the building. If you discuss with construction company, and, and investors, they want building that are built quickly and easily. So when we talk about optimization, we need to be able at the same time to look on the left at the complete building and on the right, being able to tackle multi-criteria optimization. So what we have done in, in the recent year is that we developed a methodology that allow us at design stage to look at the building from a holistic point of view and look at all these criteria. It means that when you design a building, you can at the same time look at the effect of the choices you do on all the criteria that we have mentioned. So today I will highlight only one, which is the environment. So when we look at the footprint, environmental footprint of the building, compared to a baseline scenario, so baseline scenario is the, is the building that you will find a bit everywhere if you drive into into Luxembourg you see that a lot of job site they are they, they are done like this cast in place cast in place concrete and you can optimize scenario where you combine different material so it's not a 100 percent steel material it will not be the most efficient it's a it's a building which combine in an efficient way steel and concrete and when you calculate this, the environmental impact can be reduced up to 40% by intelligently designing and, and, and doing, the, doing the construction. So we are convinced that 
we need to change the approach towards the, the construction market. We need to look at the building as a full entity. We need a global approach of the construction, taking into account all the stakeholders. So from the ID generation until final construction and use of the building, we need to take the entire life cycle of what we do, because really often we are pushing the problem on the next generation. So we look at today and what is the cheapest today? What is the fastest today? And then we let all these building stock on the shoulders of the next generation. We need really to change that and think from the beginning on, on what do we do with this building at its end of use? What, how can we refurbish easily this building to give him a new life? Then, he, when, when we look at the chain of the, of the construction, our customers, they are on the right side. It means they are the builders. That are the people which are buying the material, it, whatever the material, steel, concrete, rebars, wood, they are on the right side. But people who decide how the building will be done and how the material can be optimized are all on the left part. From the investors, the architect, program manager, engineering office, they are deciding on what will we do with the building. It's not the construction company, it's you, the people who are doing the program of the building that will decide if the building will be really environmental and if the building will properly enter in the urban environment. So we have decided to put people on the market, so engineers, architects, that are helping the investors, the engineering office, the, the, the architect to make the right choice of the steel material and the steel grid that can be used in building when they want when they want to do building in a when they want to do building in steel so that's that's all for me i thank you for your your attention thank you olivier circular and sustainable design is uh, really is essential uh, i agree uh, many thanks to the three presenters i will now leave the floor to philippe geno uh, for the Q&A session, over to you, Philippe. Uh, thank you, Charabert. Uh, thank you very much um, uh, to the three speakers. Uh, very interesting and very inspiring speeches. Um, for me, it seems really very clear that uh, we have to change, uh, really to change things and uh, we really have to act now. That is a very important point. We see that we don't have time uh, for more than 50 or 20 years uh, to change things. So that seems very clear for me. Uh, now we are going to uh, to the Q&A uh, part, and uh, I see that we have some uh, specific questions for our speakers, and uh, I would like to perhaps begin with one question for Tom. Um, that is a question that is from uh, Pavel, who is asking, what is the realistic target for the efficiency of energy usage that can be achieved through implementation, uh, uh, through implementing smart solution in a holistic way, such that you described. Tom, do you have an uh, idea on that question? Yeah, this is, uh, I, I don't know if you understand well, well the question, but um, uh, you try to ask uh, how I see the potential of reducing energy use when you construct and uh, use energy for the operation during lifetime and when you dismantle it, if I, if I understand uh, well. I, I personally think that 
this is a very interesting question. What is for sure that, uh, as um, I think Olivier showed in his presentation, that there is a huge potential to reduce energy consumption when we construct, when we extract resources, uh, when we dismantle and when we give it back and during lifetime uh, uh, we have a, a huge potential to. When I come only to the lifetime, that means when the building is finished and people move in and they use it for 30 years, um, I, I would say that compared to 10 years ago, the normal building in Europe, um, that that we have now the technology to reduce this by 80 to 90 percent, depending a little bit if it is in a residential or non-residential building. So if I take the example, what, what we what we saw in, in Luxembourg and also in Europe uh, as a trend, when you move from a 4,000 liter oil house, single family house building, um, and uh, and you, we used for that 5,000 uh, um, uh, liters of oil per year, uh, 10 to 15 years ago, we are now able to construct buildings that use an equivalent of 500 liters. So it, it, it is about 90% what we can reduce in the non-residential buildings. I, I think we, we can reach in the next five to ten years at least also this this level in making the rest renewable. Uh, when it comes to the construction energy, I see huge potential, but I, I would not uh, have the courage to describe it in percentage terms to you uh, in this context. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that shows also the importance of the life cycle of a building. It's not only a building, but also how you how you live in this uh, in this building. Okay, we have a second question uh, for uh, Vincent. Uh, what is the level of reuse of industrial wastewater today in Luxembourg? Do you have an idea on that? Yeah, uh, I don't have a precise number to give, okay, sure. but I can tell you it's quite low. Okay, sure. It's not zero because uh, there was a lot of industry which make effort to, to optimize uh, the way sure. Uh, they use uh, they use water in the in the in the industry. Uh, so instead of using water once, okay, like in pure linear model, they are using perhaps two, three, four times. Okay, so basically when they have different workshop and each workshop uh, requires different quality of water, uh, the the water coming out of the workshop one is used in the workshop two and so. Okay, so, so we can say uh, it's a kind of reuse. Okay, so, but uh, having um, uh, uh, industry. Uh, when you say okay, so I take all the the water which come out of uh, of the of the factory. Okay, so, uh, I put the the, the good uh, treatment and I reuse it uh, as much as possible. This is extremely rare. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, then there is another question, perhaps for you. Uh, it's coming from Anya, uh, asking: uh, Did the country put measures in place to address the expected water shortage? Already now. Um, so let's say when the government says okay to uh, to the 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 phage company okay don't come because we don't have enough water we can say it's a kind of measures okay but um, I would say now the, the the real measures are not there. Uh, the, 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 the government is more and more uh, aware uh, that uh, there will be a problem. Uh, for example, you can hear the, the administration of uh, water management uh, who say more and more, okay, so we need to promote recycling uh, inside uh, Luxembourg, so we need to do something. So, okay, so, so I would say so they are thinking about it, but um, uh, if there were a clear uh, measure to say, okay, so, uh, our measure to say no, you put uh, recycling uh, to, uh, to, um, to to save uh, water. This uh, needs to come. Okay. Um, then I have another question. Uh, another question for Olivier. Um, it's coming from Caroline, asking how do you see steel as a material evolving in the future? What features, functionalities should it have to be integrated into the digital world? So the link to also this digital beam questioning. Yeah. So yeah, for me there are different questions in the in the question. First of all, concern, con, concerning the the evolution as a material. So globally, steel is a material which evolves a, a lot in terms of technology. So the the steel you find today on the market, so around seventy percent of the steel you find on the market was not existing ten to fifteen years ago. So Concerning the material itself, there, there is a big evolution on 
the material properties, the, the, the strength, the, um, the, the, the elongation. So all the material properties are, are content, constantly evolving. So that, that's one thing. Then we have also a, a strong evolution on the, on the process, on the way we are producing steel. As you know, we are the first steel company in the world which has put on the paper a climate action report. So we took clear engagement by written on the way we will produce steel and our intention is to be carbon neutral for 2050 mm -hmm. and to reduce by two or emission by 2030 already. So there are a lot of things that are evolving there. Then when it, when it concerns the use of steel and all these BIM and so on. So in fact, this digital world will really help us to go to the next step. So today, when, when a building is, is demolished, it is recycled. But what we want to do is to go one step further, is to, is to reuse the component. And in order to reuse them in an efficient way, we need to keep the traceability of the material properties and all these things during the life of the building. So today, by, by law, I would say, we have a full traceability until the job site. So each beam is identified with, uh, with all the properties and so on. But it's not followed up during the life cycle of the building. With a beam model now, and a digital twin of the building, you can introduce all these properties into the twin. Like that, we will keep them until the end of use. And we will be able to recover the element to reuse them in a, in a future construction. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps one last question, a more general question. Um, we are facing now this uh, COVID-19 crisis and we see very a huge impact on the, on the construction market and the evolution of the market uh, regarding uh, construction and uh, smart eco cities. It's perhaps a question for the three speakers. Uh, just if you could just mention one issue uh, that has to be solved in the next months in order to really now uh, go on the I next stage in the development of this. I uh, think this, we have uh, deactivated all our cameras, so the, the the user they just see our pictures. Ah, okay, Natalie. Yes, perhaps. Yeah. So I'm yeah, just going to uh, to uh, yes. Uh, so for my question was that. So that we have a change now in the in the market uh, on the on on the sustainable and circular construction. And if you could just uh, mention one issue that you see uh, that has to be uh, that has to be um, faced in the next uh, in the next months in order that the market can really uh, develop now after the crisis. What do you think about that? I mean, at least I can speak for the the water part, okay? Yes. Because it, it's what uh, we have seen during this uh, this uh, COVID crisis. It's that uh, uh, water can be a vector also of uh, disease, okay? And uh, this uh, perhaps means that uh, uh, this should be no uh, included in the thinking, okay, of uh, water management to also uh, think about even more. It was already a consideration, but even more. Uh, uh, a consideration uh, about uh, hygienic uh, part of water. So it's already a concern while well, drinking water, but uh, you take care that uh, the water is clean when it's uh, the pipes coming to your tap. Okay, but then after for the wastewater, okay, and we, we we it was measured that there was we could find quite a lot of coronavirus in the wastewater, but uh, the wastewater treatment plant nowadays are not uh, at all adapted to treat viruses. Okay. Uh, Tom, do you see a special issue? I, I think it's, it's very difficult to, to make the link between, uh, between coronavirus on the one hand and, uh, and the building sector on the, on the other hand. If you, if you ask the question, if I understand well your question, you ask what, what should we do in the short and the midterm to, to address sustainability issues in, in the sustainably or to get a more sustainably uh, uh, built environment. And, uh, and, and I would like to... Uh, I would like to, to, to 
I think there is not one answer. If you think holistically, there are more answers. So, so to put it in short, on the circular level, I think uh, we will never have circular buildings, and there I join uh, what Olivier said, if we don't have a BIM, to put it in short, and if we don't have a system of material passports. We have, uh, uh, indeed, I cite here uh, 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 researchers that said, uh, waste is material without entity. If we don't give an identity to material, I'm persuaded in combination with BIM, we will not be able to, to really speak about circular construction in the future. So we need these framings, the framings of BIM and the framings of material passports, material data banks, or, or whatsoever. That's the first issue. On the smartness, we need a description like, like R2S, what I mentioned there. We need a description, what is a smart building? When is a building smart or smarter? And, and there are uh, some interesting issues. On the sustainability level, I think the instruments are there. We have quite established uh, um, sustainable certification systems with which we measure if there is sustainability in the built environment or not. And when it comes to energy, I can conclude also the same thing. So in the energy sector, we have certifications, we have, uh, we, we, we have, we can prove when we use 90% less energy. So BIM, material transport, and then an intelligent combination of all these instruments will will be the answer to get holistically more uh, sustainable, smart, circular, and energized streets. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So I see that there are very interesting, um, uh, interesting uh, discussions. Um, and um, as Charabert mentioned before, uh, all the viewers will have the possibility after this webinar uh, to network and also uh, to join uh, one of our group rooms uh, that you can find on the left side of your screen. Um, some of the speakers they will be present uh, in order to discuss with you more in detail on this um, on these different points uh, on circular project or sustainable projects and even if you want to ask some more questions uh, that will be the place to be after this webinar. Um, you will also find uh, the virtual lobby uh, with different service providers and their and their booths. Um, now I would propose that we come to the end of our webinar of today and uh, we really hope that you enjoyed it. Um, as you might have noticed during the presentation, uh, the role of Lux Innovation is uh, to support uh, this innovation and research projects uh, with our specialized teams and also with the different services we offer. Um, it is very important for us, uh, how could I say, to, uh, to link the dots, meaning uh, bringing ideas together, but also bringing people together. Um, uh, people coming from private sector, people coming from public sector, and really try to move on together uh, on this wonderful journey uh, around circularity, sustainability, and innovation. Um, it's really like, uh, it's really like Olivier said, it's a sort of really global approach. So finally, I want to thank uh, the three speakers, uh, Tom Aichen, Olivier Vassar, and Vincent Popov for their very, very inspiring and interesting keynotes. Um, I also want to thank uh, the girl behind the curtains, uh, Natalie, uh, for the whole co-organization of this uh, webinar. And of course, a very warm thank you uh, to all the viewers uh, for having participated in this uh, webinar. Um, tomorrow will be the last of our webinars, um, of our five, um, five webinars in the frame of the Smart Manufacturing Week. Um, it will be held by Arnaud Dubon and Jean-Philippe Arrier, and uh, they are going to talk about the topic on uh, smart business models. So, uh, we hope to see you soon again. Thank you very much and stay safe. Bye-bye.